Welcome in everybody. We're going to give people a few seconds here to get connected and we will start in about one minute. All right, Rob, we've got a good amount of people in here, so I'm going to kick it off to you whenever you're ready to get going. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar. Um, if you're in Texas, uh, good morning, I guess. And if you're in Eastern time zone or any other time zone where it's afternoon already, good afternoon. My name is Ravali Kosaraju. I'm the Director of Mobility at uh, WGI. Um, that's really just a fancy way of saying I'm a traffic engineer. Um, I've been uh, a traffic engineer for just over 16 years here, um, been with WGI for um, coming up to um, four years here in a few months. Um, I've worked both in public and private sectors in Texas, and then before that, Canada for um over a decade um, and then moved down to Texas um, about seven years ago now. So um, so what I'm here to um, share with you today is how to navigate traffic impact analysis or TIAs for short, um, traffic studies, um, traffic impact assessments, transportation assessments, um, those are just different variations of um, what they're called, depending on the jurisdiction that you're working with. And then also um, street impact fees, um, depending, again, on the jurisdiction that you're working with. This webinar will be focusing on um, Texas-based um, cities. Um, and then the street impact fee in particular, the slides um, will be focused more so in uh, Central Texas. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, and then just um, housekeeping, I believe you will have access to the Q&A. So if any questions pop up um, as I'm going through the slides, feel free to share them in the Q&A section and we can get them answered um, after I'm done the slides. Um, there will be some time for that. Just to give you a quick overview of uh, what I'll be talking about today, like I mentioned, um, traffic impact analysis or TIA, and then um, we'll talk about site access considerations. Um, a lot of times when I have clients coming in um, to do their TIAs with us, um, that's the big question that I get asked, hey, can I get the driver permitted the way I want it, where I want it? Um, so I'll be touching on that. And then um, we'll jump right into what street impact fee is or roadway impact fee. That's another way it might be referred to, again, depending on the jurisdiction you're dealing with. And then, of course, are there ways to avoid um, paying uh, street impact fee or SIF or RIF um, if it's referred to as roadway impact fee? Uh, so what is a TIA? Um, so sort of for our definition for it, is um, a study that assesses the adequacy of your um, of the transportation infrastructure um, based on the anticipated trips that are being generated by the proposed development, or if there's an existing development already, the redevelopment of it, or if you're proposing to rezone the parcel or parcels um, that you're looking at, the trips being generated based on that proposed um, rezoning. So could be that you're looking at vacant land and you're wanting to put something on it or there's something there already and you're adding to it. So that would um, result in an increase of trips. Um, so running the math based on any of those scenarios and determining what that does to the um, streets adjacent to it and again, depending on the jurisdiction, the immediate um, jurisdiction as well, uh, the immediate, um, sorry, road network surrounding that jurisdiction. Um, so I know this is a question that sometimes tends to catch people off guard, whether it's um, developers or 
um, civil engineers or whoever's doing the due diligence on the site is when TIA is required. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, I just realized I went scrolling through the sites. Um, so here we are. So when is the TIA required? Um, so the requirements for when a TIA um, is required can change based on the jurisdiction that you're dealing with. So for example, TxDOT um, requires the TIA if the development is generating more than 500 trips a day. So that thre threshold is pretty low. Um, and I put flexible in brackets because it comes down to they may not require TIA if you provide certain improvements within their right of way. So that may be a deceleration lane. Um, it may be a left turn lane if it's an undivided roadway. So undivided meaning that the ability to make left turns into the site exists. So in a scenario like that, they may ask for a left turn lane. So if you're willing to construct a left turn lane, they may not ask, they may not need a TIA. Um, it may mean that if uh, TxDOT doesn't want you to make left turn lane, uh, left turn movements into the site, they may say, we need you to build something to prevent that movement. So TxDOT is unique in that sense that they may already know what they need for your site to mitigate is the word, let's say. Um, and if you are willing to construct those improvements, then you essentially get to skip the TIA part. So you don't need a traffic engineer. You, you can just do all of those um, improvements um, through a plan set. So you just need a civil engineer, go through permitting. So that allows you to kind of skip the TIA part. Now, if you're wanting to go through the motion of figuring out if those improvements are truly needed, then you would need the traffic analysis to justify that whether they're needed or not. So um, TxDOT is one that, especially in the last two, three years, we've noticed that they're asking for a lot more improvements within their right of way. They've also gotten a lot more um, stringent in their requirements uh, in terms of what they will and will not allow within their right of way. So anytime you're taking access on what looks and feels like could be a text dot right of way, it, it would be very important for you to do that due diligence, I would suggest. Um, Travis County just changed their requirements for when a transportation assessment is what they call it. Now, um, they changed their threshold from 1,000 to 2,000 about, I want to say, almost a year and a half ago. Um, City of Austin went through a huge revamp of their transportation criteria manual um, in 2022. Um, their threshold hasn't changed, but the type of TIAs and the detail involved with each of them has changed considerably. Um, City of San Antonio, um, their threshold didn't change and not much has changed really with their code. Um, and they measure their trip threshold based on peak hour trips. So you'll see that that's different um, from some of the other jurisdictions that I've mentioned here. And then to the right, you'll see that um, it's based on the ITE trip generation manual, which is um, a manual that's used widely across the country here to determine the number of trips generated by each development. Um, and that's pretty standard regardless of which state that you're doing that in, that's not unique to Texas. And then to the far right is just a sample TIA worksheet. That one in particular is from Travis County. Um, so I know anytime we get a client that comes in, they're one of the first questions they ask after we put a proposal together is, well, how long is this gonna take? I need to submit this next week to the jurisdiction um, because this is holding up my permit now. Well, so because of the steps um, involved in preparing a TIA, um, uh, it can take anywhere between eight to nine weeks um, because once 
it is determined that a TIA is required, the traffic engineer, let's say me in this example, would need to negotiate the footprint of the study in with the jurisdiction. So what does that mean? It's how many intersections does the jurisdiction want us to study? Is it two, is it five, is it 10? That depends on the type of development, that depends on the number of trips that development is expected to generate, um, the level of analysis, which comes sometimes from the code, it comes from their um, manuals, if they have any, it comes sometimes from um, someone that's been reviewing TIAs at the city. So a manual doesn't exist. It's just a person that does this on a daily basis. So they're spewing out these recommendations in a meeting to us. Um, so that process typically takes about two to four weeks, uh, two to three weeks. And then based on that, once the study footprint is established, we then have to go out and collect traffic counts in the field. So that process takes another couple of weeks and then comes the actual analysis, um, which is that box in the middle, the traffic analysis. So that takes, that requires us to model these intersections in a traffic modeling software, um, which means we have to build out that whole network um, and plug in certain parameters, whether that sig intersection signalized, unsignalized, we have to acquire timings if it's signalized from that agency that maintains those signals um, and then run what's called the capacity analysis. So does that intersection function well today or is it just functioning terribly during peak hours and then we're now just throwing more trips at it? And then how do we make it better so our client is not getting taxed with having to improve an intersection that's already not functioning well. So kind of all of those nuances um, lead to that analysis and then putting that report together. I know if any of you have ever seen traffic study, it's anywhere between 200 to 800 pages. Some of them run 2000 pages. We love killing trees. That's not true, I'm just joking. Um, and then providing roadway improvements or mitigations if needed based on the analysis results. So the analysis itself takes another three to four weeks. So hence the whole process taking about eight to nine weeks, um, depending on again, the type of development, if there's any phases to the development and all that. Now you'll see here, I've got color coding for the types of um, steps in the TIA process. Um, the boxes that are in gray um, tend to be iterative, if anything, with the development changes. So things like side access points, things like um, development land uses and density. So if any of those changes, we have to go right back to step one and redo our entire analysis. So it's important for um, the client and or the civil to keep the traffic engineer informed because changes like that can impact the traffic study dramatically. And typically the jurisdictions like for the traffic study to reflect whatever shown, especially in the site plan, if you're at a site plan stage. So keep that in mind as you're working with your traffic engineer on your team. Um, because once you get to submittal and you're working towards approval, you don't want to have those discrepancies because that can just result in more delays, which does not help with your site plan approval timings. Um, so jumping into site access considerations. I know this has a lot of detail on here, um, but I wanted to highlight that when it comes to site access, um, these are some elements that you want to think about sooner than later. Um, things like where you want to place your access. What kind of access do you want to have? Do you want to have a write in, write out only? Do you want to have full access? Um, if you want to have full access, um, do you think you might need left turn lanes? Um, do you want to have maybe right in, right out and left turn in only and no lefts out? Well, those last couple of things is where a traffic engineer comes in handy because we may not have all the codes memorized for all the cities, but 
we have a good pulse on a lot of the code. Um, like for example, um, text dot driveway spacing is 425 feet on a lot of their frontage roads. So if you called me and said, hey, I wanna put these two driveways 300 feet apart, I could tell you that during your due diligence, heck, even before you were doing due diligence, when you're looking at a site and you were telling me, I wanna have this type of development, I could tell you, I know for this type of development, you need two driveways and this site only has 500 feet of frontage. You can't have two driveways. Are you sure you can live with that for the type of development that you're doing? So those are things that are super valuable for you to know upfront and the traffic engineer can help you save a lot of headache, not to mention money down the road if you engage them early on. So um, food for thought. Um, and then discussing turn lanes. So again, like I mentioned earlier, TxDOT has gotten pretty stringent. Um, and when I say that, what that means is they've reverted back to their man their access management manuals and their roadway design manuals that they've had um, for a while, but they've just not given a lot of concessions in a lot of situations. So that leaves us with having to build turn lanes that tend to be pretty lengthy. So you'll see, for example, the table to the right, table 3-3, if the posted speed is 50, miles per hour, the turn lane, in the past we could negotiate it down to 265, but now it needs to be 415 feet long, plus a storage length of, um, well, um, 100 feet. So that adds up to 515 feet. Now, if your site frontage is only 400 feet, that math doesn't quite add up. So you're now building a turn lane that potentially impacts another property. So is there right of way for you to be able to do that? We can run the math to tell you, A, if you're going to trigger the need for a turn lane, B, we can do a preliminary look to see, are you gonna be able to make this turn lane even work? So those are all, and if you can't build it, you know, how can you have those conversations with TxDOT early on to prevent A, permit delays, B, what are the options here for you to be able to still get your site developed, still get the land use that you wanna get built um, and not have to deal with the challenges that come with this down the road. So, especially if it's an agency like TxDOT where things in general tend to be a bit on the longer side with their driveway permitting. And if you have to enter into a donation agreement with them, these are all elements that we can help with. Um, especially if you're working with TxDOT San Antonio district or the Austin district or the Dallas district, um, really any district with, with TxDOT because we worked with all of them at this point. Um, so another element for you to consider would be the turn lane requirement, something um, to pay attention to. I'm just using TxDOT as an example because their turn lane lengths tend to be the lengthiest. Um, so it's pretty safe to assume that this is as worse as it gets when it comes to turn lane design. Now, um, if um, any of you have ever experienced this, you'll know uh, what I'm talking about when I um, start getting into the weeds with this. Um, another kind of hiccup that we deal with when we talk about site access is um, driveways not getting approved because there's a site distance issue. So when you talk about driveways, um, it meets the spacing requirement. It meets the requirements to um, allow for a turn lane to be built, whether that's a right turn lane or a left turn lane. That's great, checks off those boxes. Then we start looking at safety, um, which is sight distance. Can a driver leaving the driveway 
safely make a right turn or a left turn to exit the driveway? Can they see a car coming towards them in either direction to be able to make a movement out of that driveway? So that's what sight distance um, check reviews, essentially. So the graphs that you see up top here, what those are checking for is vertical sight distance. So if you're ever, I mean, I guess most of you might be driving, all of you might be driving, but um, anytime like you're on top of a hill or you're heading up to a top of a hill, right? Especially on two lane roads and there's that car s driving really slow in front of you and it you, you're in a section where you can pass, but you can't really take a chance because you don't know what's coming at you. So that's vertical side distance issue, right? Because you can't safely make that maneuver because you can't see. Those are the kinds of checks that the driveway side distance um, checks allow us to do. And that's what jurisdictions wanna make sure that we are not creating. They don't want us to create a problem because that driveway is new. So if we can avoid creating situations like that, they wanna make sure that we um, can do that. Um, so another, so the vertical side distance is not very common. A lot of jurisdictions don't ask for that. The most common one is horizontal side distance. So what is that? You're going around a bend um, and you don't expect to see a driveway or you're going around a bend and you can't see a driveway because of the roadway curvature. So that's a more common check that we're asked to perform. And if it doesn't meet minimum side distance criteria as established by AASHTO, which is a technical roadway design manual, um, or jurisdiction's own criteria that they have in their code, either or, um, then there are certain movements that the jurisdiction may not allow for your driveway to have. So it could look like that you can have right in, right out, but you may not have left in, left out, or you may have right in, right out and left in, but you can't have left out. Um, worst case scenario would be right in, right out. Middle ground would be right in, right out and left in. Um, that's as far as we can see it going if side distance is not met. So this is another check that we're able to perform um, if we're engaged early on um, because we can run these checks based on where the driveway location is, based on the jurisdiction's criteria, depending on what they've adopted for their standards. So um, yeah, and that's, that's kind of what the slide is talking about. Um, so to summarize, essentially when you're thinking about driveways, you want to make sure that you're considering the topography of the roadway. Um, you're considering um, location of the driveway and how it's placed compared to adjacent driveways. Um, so driveways that are already pre-existing, um, whether that's to the left and right of you or even opposing to you, because there are prerequisites for meeting certain offsets from any of those driveways that are already there. Um, and if you're proposing more than one driveway, you certainly wanna check code requirements for what that looks like, because there are minimum number of driveways that you can have for frontage. And if you're proposing five, um, A, will all of them be approved? B, do you need that many? Is there a way to consolidate driveways? And then of course, turn lanes. Um, we talked at length about that. Are all of them going to fit? Um, how many will you need? And then, of course, all of this comes down to cost, right? Because at the end of the day, what is the um, cost impact going to look like to your development? The sooner you find that out, the better it will be for your development, because then you can make certain decisions on how your development is going to move forward. Um, so, um, all of these are elements that you want to keep in mind when you're talking about drive replacement because your side axis can really make or break your development. Um, 
So before I dive into street impact fee, we're going to do a little poll. Um, and we're just going to use the raise hand feature to do it. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have worked in city of Austin or have projects in city of Austin or have an interest um, in developing city of Austin? If you want to raise your hand, um, just so I can kind of gauge. And then Dan, if you want to help me with where the raise the hand feature is, because I can't see. Yeah, it'll show up in the uh, participant section. Right now we have no one raising their hand. Okay, so our, I'm assuming everyone is either not working in Austin or is out of state. So this content may or may not be as relevant for um, most of you, but um, a lot of the math at least is going to be similar in a lot of the cities that do have roadway impact fee or street impact fee but the specific ordinances and the exceptions that I'm talking about may not be as applicable. So something to keep in mind. Um, so streetway, street impact fee or roadway impact fee um, is another impact type of impact fee, just like water or wastewater impact fee, but specifically for transportation infrastructure. And it's intended to fund roadway capacity uh, improvements or capital improvements um, that are geared towards accommodating new development. Um, the, in spe um, specifically for city of Austin, there was an ordinance that was approved in December, 2020 that all new building permits that were issued after June 21st, 2022 uh, would be subject to SIF. There were some exceptions that went along with it, but since all those timelines have ended, I just didn't include them. Um, and there used to be a fee in lieu option with all the TIAs that were done in the city. All of those uh, went away um, with the uh, street impact fee now. And every development with a few exceptions pretty much is subject to SIF. Now, let's see, which other cities in Texas have adopted SIF or RIF? So you'll see here, um, I will admit, this map is not spatially accurate. So if any of you are geography buffs, do not come at me. Uh, I do not claim to be a geography person. I just needed to find a way to roughly show all the different cities that have adopted RIF or SIF. And you'll see there's quite a few, and this is not even an exhaustive list. Um, the These are ones that have just popped up in um, my work in Texas. Um, so you'll see that there's obviously quite a few cities in Texas that have gone to this model of uh, collecting SIF for, RIF for new developments. I shouldn't say developments, new developments, it's any developments. So what's the math? Um, so there's two types when it comes to SIF. So one is the max um, SIF or RIF, and then once they collected, again, the, that model is going to be pretty similar in any jurisdictions that you work with. Um, and the difference being, um, again, specific to Texas, there is um, a state law that establishes rough proportionality. So what that is, is when you're developing a property and you're going for permitting, any jurisdiction that you're working with cannot, cannot ask you for improvements that exceed the roughly proportionate cost based off your development. And that, I, I'm kind of watering it down, but essentially there has to be a way to calculate the roughly proportionate cost of your development and the jurisdiction cannot ask you for anything that exceeds the cost of that ceiling. So the max SIF establishes that ceiling. Um, so it's just a way to calculate that dollar amount um, so that the developers know what that 
top end looks like. Um, and then the collected SIF would be the amount that a developer would be writing a check for. Um, so in Austin, now this formula is specific to Austin, um, but a lot of jurisdictions have adopted this same model. So this can be applied to a lot of other jurisdictions as well. Um, but again, this model and this formula exactly is pulled from the city of Austin street impact fee process. Um, the city has divided their entire city into 17 service areas and each service area is assigned a different dollar amount based on the type of improvements that are required for that service area. So that's why the service areas are important. Um, so you'll see here that it's broken down based on location, the vehicle mile of travel um, during the PM peak hour, because that tends to be the busier time of day. Um, the development unit is the type of development that's occurring. So that is the variable that changes um, that you bring in essentially. So what type of development are you um, coming in with? So that's the variable that you would be contributing to this equation. And then the service area would be, again, another variable that you would be contributing to because which of the 17 service areas are you working in? Um, so that would be another one that you'd be contributing to the formula. And then the roadway capacity plan is something that the city worked with the consulting firm on to establish what are the needs for each of the 17 areas in terms of infrastructure based on the anticipated growth of the city. Um, and that's how the roadway capacity plan was developed. So you'll see the two formulas down below. The max SIF is calculated based on the fee per service unit um, times the vehicle miles per development unit. Again, like I said, development unit comes from your specific program and then times the number of development units. And then the collected fee is the fee per development unit times the development units. Um, so that establishes the formula for calculating your fee. And this is something that you can do yourself. The information's online on the city's website. If you just look up City of Austin Street Impact Fee, um, I don't know that every other city does it that way, but City of Austin is pretty transparent with the whole process. So you do have access to run the math um, yourself. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to us um, um, to do due diligence on sites for both site access and street impact fee if you'd like. Um, we're happy to do that as part of a site DD if you'd like. Now, what does SIF mean um, for your development, right? Because there are instances where the city may choose to just collect SIF and not actually have you do a TIA, which is great because then you don't not losing that time on your project for the TIA review and approval. So this means that the city is going to collect dollars from your development and put those into funding improvements um, such as um, turn lanes, signals, um, maybe even adding sidewalks, if that's something that's identified in the uh, RCP or roadway capacity plan, could be roundabouts, anything that's on the RCP essentially. Or alternatively, if you had to do a TIA, and those are some of the improvements that your TIA um, identified, then you would, as long as they're on the RCP and you decide to construct some of those improvements, you can get credit towards those improvements if you decide to construct them. So you'd be writing a smaller check to the city because the SIF again is collected on pretty much all developments with a handful of exceptions. So speaking of exceptions um, and potentially avoiding SIF. So if your development generates less than 10 trips, which your development would have to be pretty small in size to have a trip gen that small. Um, or if you're a supermarket in very specific areas of the city or walk-in or drive-in bank, or if you're a daycare 
in all service areas so that uh, that daycare is a very new addition because the city recognizes the lack of daycare services. Um, so the council just decided to add that in um, that as an amendment to the SIF ordinance. Um, so any of those um, land uses get some exceptions. Um, but other than that, um, pretty much everything else is subject to SIF. Um, but if you generate more than or equal to 10 trips a day, though, uh, you can still claim cr some credits. I already talked about building improvements and reducing the um, dollar amount that you would have to write a check for. But there's also things like TDM reductions that you could be doing. For example, um, if you want to maybe install bike showers, if you want to hand out transit passes to your employees, or if you already plan to do that, you can claim that as a credit. Those are just some things I can think of off the top of my head. Um, there's also certain land uses, um, like if you're building apartments with uh, retail, um, there's some crossover trips that happen between the two land uses. That's what internal capture is. So that reduces your trip impact, which can reduce your SIF um, impact as well. Um, affordability is another one that can help reduce your SIF, but that does require buy-in from several entities, as you can see on the slide there. Um, already talked about offsetting your costs by constructing improvements. Um, and then the map to the right here is just a snap of some of the roadway capacity improvements um, on the top north end of the city here. Again, this map is also online, so feel free to go on there and take a look if you're interested. Um, and with that, our presentation comes to an end here, leaves us some time for Q&A. If anyone has any questions, happy to take them, or if you wanna take a moment to drop some questions in there. If anybody has any questions, just drop them in the Q&A and we'll get them read out to Ravali. Doesn't look like we're getting anything right now. I'll give them a few more minutes, but I will encourage people if they do have questions to email Ravali and also keep a lookout for our follow-up email and webinar recap blog that will be posted uh, by Monday at the latest. Still have a few more seconds for questions. If you want to ask anything, drop them in the Q&A. Everything was just crystal clear, I guess. All right. Well, like I said, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and email Ravali uh, and keep an eye out for our follow-up email uh, coming on Monday. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Ravali. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good afternoon.